Okay. Um, hey. Uh, welcome to the third session of scientific programming in Python. Um, I hope I'm better in time this time than the last time. Uh -huh. um, I need like half an hour for the last part of last time, but never mind that. Uh, I uploaded the um, note, uh, the IPython notebook I'm using, but not exactly the one I'm using, but uh, one with a bit more text, um, such that you can just uh, work in it simultaneously to the lecture. Okay, um, due to time constraints, I've decided to not uh, speak about the homework here. I will rather do that in the tutorial. So the tutorial will, we hope we're not sure because the ROM provider who hasn't answered us, will normally always be here from now on because there's obviously more space. Um, and we will present them the sample solution at first and then go through uh, the new stuff. Yes. When was the deadline for today's homework? Uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes ago. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm running the grading script right now. I'm not sure if, I, if it's done in, in the next half an hour, um, but it should be. Okay, yeah, so I will upload the, I will publish the sample solution after the lecture and I will also, you will get the emails and hopefully only one right after the lecture. This time. Oh, did anybody have problems? Did anybody not receive an email about the homework even though he or she should? There are at least two people who should because two people at least uh, have their GitHub names but didn't connect their GitHub profiles to their uh, Z login. I did not get an email. I don't know. Okay, then I will, uh, let's talk about that after the lecture. Okay, good. Um, uh, first of all, there's actually quite a lot of repetition from last week. So like I said, um, there's not gonna be one common thing here, I'm just gonna give you some uh, information about some Python stuff which I think <coughs> is, is important to know. Yes? I can make it bigger, I keep forgetting. Um, stuff that I think is important to know. So next week, um, first of all next week, Rüdiger is gonna present and second of all he's gonna uh, do uh, NumPy, so from next week on we're actually talking about scientific Python. Okay, uh, first of all I think this function didn't work in the end. So this is just uh, to get you started again in uh, arcs, in the uh, star arcs and star star keyword arcs. So we created our stream function here which takes an arbitrary number of normal arguments and an arbitrary number of keyword arguments. Then it creates a new list, goes through all the arguments, which is a list, or rather a certain kind of iterable. Um, it appends to this empty list the uppercase one and then calls the built-in fun function print with the new parameters, which is the uppercase version of the normal ones. Um, then we define the function myPrint, which also had the strings here and had one special keyword argument to stream. Um, and depending on that, it either calls our stream function here or the built-in print function. And then we can simply redefine print equals myPrint because in Python functions are first order objects and we can just assign new names to them. And then all the time uh, we can use our do stream here and if we don't want to use it, we can just turn it off. And then it prints it normally. Okay, um, classes. I talked about, at least in the tutorial, I talked about Dunga methods. Um, and you obviously use them, I hope, for your homework because otherwise <laughs> uh, you couldn't quite solve them. Uh, but I skipped the first part about classes, so I'm just gonna do it here again. So. Python is object oriented, so you can make classes. Every class implicitly inherits from object because every class is in the end an object. So you can either write that explicitly or that inherits from object um, or it does it explicitly anyway. And if we just define an empty class here where we want to have a log string and if we don't have any lines after that, we use pass to show Python that there's not, nothing intended here, intended here. Um, and then if we create an instance of that class, it's of type my class. Okay, and so to check if something is an instance of our class, we can use the isInstance. And this instance uh, works for the class we created plus all its parents. So everything is an instance of object. Functions are instance of object, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and if we wanna know uh, what our class is, we can show the doc string with the question mark, the FF. Okay, so then classes have methods and attributes. So 
Um, I explained already that every so methods are basically functions under that work on instances of classes. I explained already last week that if you have a first parameter called a cell, um, then it is an instance method. If not, it's a weird kind of class method. And um, yeah, the init dunder method is a special one. It's the constructor. It's the same thing as in, as in Java, where we have the name of the class again. That's the constructor. And then um, this parameter self is called on instances. So we make B an instance of the class. And this assigns the self parameter. This assigns V to the self parameter. And thus, self is now um, the exact object, the exact instance of this class. So it shows that it's an instance of class, of object my class, at a certain memory address. And its class is the class we just defined. <coughs> OK. Um, we can have um, also instance attributes and um, class attributes. So every variable which does not dereference from self, which is not self dot something, is a class variable, which also means because self is only defined in instance methods, where the first parameter of the argument is a self, uh, you can only define instance, function, uh, instance um, variables in instance functions. So here, self.number, number is an instance variable, an instance attribute, whereas this variable one is not. So what we do in this class here, in the constructor, we need a number. And uh, where if we call the constructor with a number, then we assign the instance attribute number uh, to that number. So if we create the class twice, one with a two and one with a three, then they have different numbers, of course. Um, Class variables can be called from instances, uh, can be accessed from instances, and can also be accessed from the class itself. Um, whereas instance variables, of course, can't because they are bound to the instance and not bound to the class. So if I now um, increase, for example, um, whoops. Oh, yeah, it was a string. Um, I now change this variable here. I was a bit poor. Okay. Um, oh, that's weird. Hold on. Okay, so who can tell me why that happened? Strings are immutable. Uh, strings are immutable. So if I would make that here a list. Then say in that variable at a certain position. Then it changes it for all of them. Sometimes really confusing with mutables and immutables. Oh, I'm so glad I think of it also. <laughs> okay. Um, and yes, the number is an instance variable, that doesn't exist in the class. Yes? So you can't change what kind of variable it is, like the type. Um, well, but we, hmm. If you would now put an integer there instead of a list. <coughs> um. <coughs> huh. Then it creates a local, uh, then it creates an instance variable of the same name because it can't change the immutable, um, uh, because, no way. It can't change the name of that, so it must create an instance variable of the same name in that situation. And now if we call b.variable, um, it's the one that I'm not sure if this works, but in theory, if I would call, yes, if I would call it. So this here, the type b makes, um, finds the class to which this <laughs> instance belongs, and there the variable one is still what we defined it before, so we can overwrite it. Um, but it's then just not seen in the, so it's just not seen in this instance anymore, but we can get it from the instance. Well, I was lucky that it actually worked. <laughs> okay, um, inheritance. Uh, we know inheritance from Java. We can have, for example, we have a class animal, and then we have a class land animal that 
extends anywhere, um, which also is a constructor. And then if we create a new land animal, then of course this instance of land animal is also an instance um, of animal. So it extends from that. Uh, what doesn't exist in Java, but what exists in Python is um, multiple inheritance. So we just created a land animal. We can also create a water animal. So, and this here has the um, attribute can swim, land animal that can walk. Um, and here in the constructor, we say it has legs false, whereas in the land animal, we set it to true. And then we create an amphibian which inherits from land animal and water animal. And now if I create a new amphibian, yes, it is a land animal, and yes, it is a water animal. Uh, but what are the results of the instance variables? Can our amphibian swim? Can it walk? And does it have legs? That's a problem of multiple inheritance, which Java didn't want to solve, because here has legs is set to true, oops, set to true, and here it's set to false. And Java said, map, this is conflicting. I don't know what to do about that. Python simply says, um, the first one in the list. So because we had first land animal and then water animal, um, it inherits the one from land animal. And if we would change that, then we would override it. Uh, then we would take the one from the water animal. So multiple inheritance works, but order matters, actually. OK, we can also cons uh, call the cons constructor of the super class, for which we need the super um, method. And then we can, from that, call underscore <coughs> init. So if we want to do that, uh, if we want in an initializer, in a constructor, want to call the super constructor, what we have to do is use the args and keyword arguments and call the super constructor with those, because we don't know what arguments uh, it may have required. And with this, we make sure um, that we give it all the arguments uh, that it would have required anyway, that it can take all arguments. OK, um, then a real important thing about Python is uh, duck typing. It's a philosophy. It's not, it's not an actual typing um, format. Python is uh, strong and dynamically typed. But what the philosophy of how to program in Python is called duck typing, which means if something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. So in duck typing, what we do <laughs> is we look, we simply try out if we can do with an object what we want to do with it. We don't check if it's of instance iterable or something. We simply try to iterate through it. And if we can iterate through it, then it's probably an iterable full stop. And that's basically connected to the uh, easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission, which we had last week. So if we simply, so imagine we create some animal which looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Um, and then we create an instance of that animal. So here, we create in 50% of cases, so if random dot random int, it's either 0 or 1. 50% of cases, we create uh, this some animal which looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. And then the other 50% of cases, we create a frog. And now, if we want to know if we can do stuff with it, we simply look if it has this attribute looks like, and if it looks like a duck, and if it has the attribute quacks like, and it quacks like a duck, and if so, it is a duck, and we use it um, as a duck for all that matters. So in this case, 50-50, it was not a duck, but a frog. So here we see we thought it was a frog, and the type is actually frog. And now, for all that matters, it's a duck. So it's 50-50. So this is how we would actually work in Python. It's Pythonic programming. You don't need to, um, but it's a neat way. OK. And then, um, finally, the Python data model. Um, you needed to do this for the homework, so I assume uh, you know how it works now. So if we have a equals 3 plus 3, um, then that's just the same as calling the Dunga method add from the init class with the parameters 3 and 3. So because the first one is an int, and then there's the plus, Python internally calls the underscore underscore add method on the type of the first one with two, with both as a summandan, summans, the both as a summans as arguments. And then that's basically, that's the very same thing. So internally, 
the upper one Python rewrites it as the lower one. It's called uh, syntactic sugar. So it rewrites it. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't add anything to the program language. It's just prettier to write. And if we want to create new classes which are able, uh, so on which these operators work in the way we intend them to, uh, then we need to define the operators. So the dot init, the constructor, we know already of that. And what's here in total required, as we know, is the yeah, underscore underscore add underscore underscore method. So we need to define for, our, in this case, triple class, we need to define something, we need to define the dunder method add such that we can then add two triples. For, if we want to print it and want, it to, want to print whatever we want to print there, we can also do that. Um, we have to do the dunder method string for that, you did that. And if we want to check for the in operator, so the, in op the dunder method, which the in operator uses, is uh, contains. So if we now create uh, two triples, um, then we can add them. So we can use either a plus b or a dot add b. Why can we do that? <coughs> because this here, so normally, so here we only have one parameter, but actually in the um, parameter list for add, there are two. Why is that? Because if we call um, an instance method on the instance, Python internally again rewrites that as calling this method on the type of the instance and then using the instance as the first parameter. So basically this here is type a dot add and then with parameters self and other. So these are all equivalent and this is how Python internally rewrites your operator. Okay, so we can now check for if three is in the triple one to three, and yes, it is. Yes. So if you would have, uh, if you um, undo what you did right now, that you typed in type. Uh, so I'm talking about the class called triple. Yeah, right. If you if you type in triple, uh, is it isn't it then a class uh, method? Yes, but um, instance methods are basically class methods, and if you call them on an instance, then Python will simply internally make that out of it. So they just have, you can, so basically they're just not different, you, but you just interpret the first parameter as self, and then let Python do the magic of giving you the instance as the first parameter, ah, yeah. and then you can use that as if it was. Okay. Um, and we'll get to uh, the class method decorator in a second, and then we'll see why the decorator is actually necessary. Great. Yeah. Okay, um, so what if we now try to iterate through that? We get a type <laughs> error because contains works for in, for checking in, but doesn't work for um, looping over it, because for that it must be an iterable. An iterable is something that returns an iterator. So, which one of these three would work, and which one of these three is actually Pythonic? How would we check if we can iterate through our triple class? Yes. The last one would be Pythonic, which, because in the first example we checked whether it is an instance of iterable, which we didn't want to do, and in the last one we just tried, but if there is an, an exception, then, then we just add it. And the second one would um, stand up how it would, would work, but it would be um, Pythonic as well. Um, yeah, the first one doesn't even work. So you're correct. The, the last one is Pythonic because it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. We just try to iterate through it. And if it doesn't work, we simply ignore it. And the second one is uh, look before you leap. So we check. So we know that for something, we know that to iterate through something, it must have either the, I, the iter dunder method or the get item. So we check if it actually does, and if it does, then we iterate through it. And the first one would assume that our, um, that our object, which we just created, which is a triple, um, actually is an iterable. So it, for example, it extends the class iterable. And we don't need to do this. So there is no class iterable. There is, you can check actually, there is, you can import the module um, to check if something is an iterable. But this internally does nothing else than this here. So as our triple doesn't extend a class iterable, we can't, doesn't make any sense to check if it is an iterable. And thus this here doesn't work. 
the other two, however, do work. And don't return anything because uh, it's not iterable yet. Okay, so the general idea in Python, to assume an iterable and then fall gracefully if it does not work. And how do we make our triple an iterable? We define the dum-dum method eta, which returns an iterator. So an iterable is something that has the dum-dum method eta, which will return an iterator. So it's a magic method that makes an object iterable. And then on iterables, Python calls um, the <coughs> method uh, eta, which will simply call the dum-dum method of that, um, and make an iterator out of that. And in for loops, for example, what's simply done in for loops, you call next on the iterator. So Python internally calls next on the iterator until a stop iteration is reached. Okay, so for example, to have our own range function, um, this here is an iterable and an iterator. It's iterable because we can make an iterator out of it. And it's also an iterator because where the iterator is the very object, the very instance of the object, and something is an iterator if the dum-dum method next is defined on it. And then well, what this obviously does is when we initialize it, we create a new instance of y range until a number. Um, and then every time we loop through it, we start with the number zero, and then we return one, two, three, four, five until we reach this uh, limit, and then we raise the stop iteration. And the stop iteration is a sign for a for loop that it should stop the iteration now. Okay, so we can now use our y range, um, next works on it, and then we can loop through it. <coughs> if you're working with uh, iterables and iterators, keep in mind that everything you do on iterators um, need uh, uh, empty them. So if you looped over an iterator once, then you can't iterate over it again, and uh, you have to create a new one. Oh, this is always so confusing. Okay. Um, yes, Python relies heavily on iterators. It's a major concept of Python, and you should use them every time Python offers them. So for example, to check all if, um, if all elements of a list are numbers, which you needed to do in the homework, what you do is you go through every element and check if it's an instance of int or float. So you can check for two um, at the same time with the syntax. However, what you shouldn't do, I mean, it, it's possible, but what you shouldn't do is you go, you can take i as a normal index variable, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, until the length of the list, and then uh, check for the list at position i. That's not Pythonic. Pythonic is to go to loop through the iterable itself, through the list itself, and then have elem not be the index of an element, but the element itself. <coughs> as long as you don't have to change values of the list, which you couldn't do here because you simply return iterator, which is a, a copy of the list. As long as you don't need to change values, this here is the Pythonic way um, to do it, to loop through lists. I've seen that in uh, many homeworks differently. Okay, um, and lastly to uh, last week, which actually took half an hour, or half, um, we had the decorator's property and static method. So what the decorator property simply does, it makes this function, it changes this, so what decorators generally do is they change functions or methods. And this add property decorators changes the function such that it doesn't need an empty program to list anymore such that you don't need the parenthesis anymore. So you can just simply create a triple and call triple.data without parenthesis, and um, it works. That's the only thing which the property decorator does. And then there's the um, static method decorator, which will um, make a method static, which as far as I, as I uh, saw myself, only changes that you cannot call something from the instance. So basically, we could assume this function here, so we wouldn't need to have the static method uh, decorator. And then we could simply um, do a.create, and then num2, so 2, 3. So, oh no, this here would throw us an error, of course, because you can't assign to um, properties. By the way, in the homework, you wouldn't even have to deep copy it because you can't assign to properties anyway. Um, 
Here, if we don't have the add property decorator, one second, we don't have the add property decorator, then we can call a.create23, even though the, uh, oh no, then we need the create outside method. That's a, oh no, the create here. So this takes three parameters and we call it with two. And this is because what Python internally now does is to call type a dot create a two three. So we now created um, an, a triple where the first part of the triple is an instance of triple, which doesn't make much sense. And the add property decorator simply forbids that the fur that you call him uh, the add you know, the add property the add static method. Sad. Uh, simply forbids that you call it on um, on instances. Or rather, when you call it instances, it just doesn't use the instances as the, as the first argument. Yeah. Could you once more repeat why you uh, put an underscore before the instance variable data after the self? Um, so, as you may know, in uh, Java, you have um, <coughs> modifiers for how visible it is. You can have public, uh, private, protected, and default. And Python, that doesn't exist. Visibility doesn't doesn't matter for Python. Everything is visible everywhere. However, there's just a convention that if you if something is internal data, then you use the unders then you uh, use an underscore at the so beginning. That's private, actually. It's not private at all. You can access it from everywhere outside. It's just a hint for other developers that this was intended to be not used from outside of this class. Okay. You could even use two um, underscores before that. Then would be um, and if you use two in front of it, then it would even change the name, that's called name mangling, to change the attribute such that from outside this class, you would have to call, it would be named uh, underscore triple underscore underscore data, name mangling. Um, not important for you because nobody uses it anyway as far as I've seen it, but just one underscore at the beginning means please don't use from outside. But you can't forbid it because Python doesn't have um, the modifier for that. Okay, and as I said, this static method create is it's just a, a normal function under the namespace of triple. So this here does just the same as the create outside with the only difference that you call here triple.create and here you simply call create outside. So you will get the feeling when to use static methods once you develop your own modules, which will probably be <coughs> quite some time. Um, but then it makes sometimes sense to use static methods. Okay, any questions to that? Good, okay, advanced Python. Generators, um, really cool, really important concept of Python. A Python generator is a function which doesn't use return but uses yield. You've may, you may be, maybe you've seen that before. So what a generator does is when it's called, then it executes the function from the beginning of the function until the first yield statement. And then when you call it again, it doesn't need to start at the beginning of the function again, but it resumes its operation after the first yield, where every variable and so on um, will be recovered and the generator continues from there. So every time now, if we have, so for example, we have this um, generator generate numbers, which yields one, then 10, then three, then five. So the first time we call it, it would yield a one. The next time we call it, it would resume its operation from here, yield a 10, and then from there, and then from there. So generators are basically sub-processes, um, which, which will do their stuff, and then hand over uh, the return to the original function that called them, but as soon as they're called again, they can resume where they left. Yes. Do you have you have to know in the beginning how many times you're going to iterate it? No, it doesn't matter because why does it not why does it not matter to know how often you iterate through it? Because a generator is an iterator. So and what an iterator simply does, it loops through it loops over all its elements, and as soon as it's done, it throws a stop iteration. So if we we can loop through this generator because it's an iterable, uh, iterable, not iterator, sorry. Um, and then it will just yield all the values, and as soon as it reached the end here, or a normal return, um, it will uh, throw a stop iteration, and that stops it. So, 
Where's the stop box? Where's the stop it away? Okay, I can simply also return. So if we now return in between, um, it will simply only go until we return because Python internally makes a stop iterator out of that return statement. Um, generators are really useful. So let's make, uh, so let's lose, yeah, let's use the function here and we sign it A. So now A is an instance of generator objects. So generators return generators object, generator objects. And we can iterate over generator objects just the same way as we can iterate over, over iterators. So if we call next ones and then loop over this iterator, then we had the one already and we continue um, from the 10 here, continue from this yield here. And now if we try to call next ones again, it will, as I said, throw a stop iteration, which tells Python and which tells for loops and everywhere where you loop over stuff um, that it's empty here and you should stop trying to get values from it. So um, yes, a generator is an iterable and a generator is an iterator because otherwise it wouldn't have the gender methods iter or next. Okay, so generators are really important if we want to do stuff with a large number of, um, of uh, values. So for example, in the last week, I had this where I made a range from uh, one to sys.max size, which doesn't work if it's a list because Python has to create an entire list of, uh, of all the numbers beforehand. And it worked in Python 3 where it was an iterator because they could Python could just make the number on the spot. So every time you want to have one value at a time, you want to have a function that returns all values from one to a billion, but returns one, one value at a time, or you need one value at a time, then you would use a, a, a generator. So imagine here we have, uh, we know that already. Um, this, is our, uh, this is our method to find primes. So there is prime, <laughs> Function, I explained it's just the same as the first one, it returns if a number is prime. And now imagine we want to get all primes. What we could do is um, where we have this function get primes until a number, and that here creates a list from all the primes until a certain number. So it goes through one, goes through all numbers, one, two, three, four, five, until whatever we say here, and then adds all the primes it found on its way uh, to a list, result list, and then in the end returns the result list. And if we call that uh, for the first 10 numbers, it perfectly works. It returns all prime numbers lower than 10. Uh, but what would happen if we uh, want to call it on the first, I don't know, billion prime, on the first billion natural numbers? Well, it will run forever because it will only create the first one, so we only return the list of primes once it went through all the numbers, which takes, of course, a really, really long time. But we just want the first ones already. We can't wait for the first ones while you're calculating the new ones. So the, the problem here is that the function only gets the chance to return the results once. Wouldn't it be way more useful if we would return a result once we make it? And for that, we simply make a generator out of that. So this function here is now the same one as the one above, <coughs> just that we don't have the result list here and we don't append to our result list every time we do find a prime and then in the end return this result list. But simply as soon as we find a prime, we yield it. So if we now loop over this iterator, it will find the first prime, yield it, we can print it, we look for the second prime, yield it, we print it, look for the third prime, yield it, we print it, and that can just work on forever. So um, for demonstration purposes, I let it sleep for half a second in between. But now we can use the function in here. When we need the next prime number, we simply ask the generator to generate us the next one with next, and we can use all the other ones in between. So as soon as you have really large ranges of numbers, Getting generators of it is a really useful thing. And you will have to do in the homework. Okay. Generators? Generators. Okay. Completely different, yes. So the function does not continue until I call the next iteration. Yes. So in
no. operation in some other thread or somewhere? As or long as you don't use explicit multi-threading, um, every operation you do in Python is linear. And actually, it's really hard to do real multi-threading in Python because Python just Python needs a virtual machine and only has one instance of that at a time, so it's really hard to make real multiprocessing in Python. Um, but no, but you can do with that, and that's that's the way you would use it. You would do it anyway. You would need a generator that creates it. Blah blah blah. <coughs> okay, um, completely different topic. I O. Um, how do we actually open files and stuff, and how do we actually work with files? Well, the syntax is simply open. So imagine we have a string here. I want to write a message to a file. Then I open the file um, with the uh, mode w. w means write. So we have read, write, append, and also read, write, and append in binary. Um, you have to pay attention, read, for example, CSVs. Uh, in Python 2, wrote and write and wrote and wet in binary, uh, whereas in Python 3, even CSVs read normally, which makes way more sense. But if you have old code, Python 2 code, you have to change the uh, read binary to a read if you, if you port from Python 2 to Python 3. So how, to, how do we uh, write to a file? Well, we open it in writing mode, we write to the file, and then we close the file handle. So this here will make so we open the file and um, create a file handle, and we can assign that file handle to a variable, and we can work with that variable, and then we have to close the file that lies behind the file handle again. Um, you have to close files because otherwise your computer will crash eventually. So uh, you can even show how many open files uh, your, lap your computer can have uh, at a time. My laptop can do not more than 1,024 1, files. Uh, Linux eventually tells you that um, that you have too many open files. Windows just crashes, so don't um, don't open too many files. And if you do, close them again. <laughs> okay. So this is just syntax on how we can uh, this IPython notebook use bash commands. So cut is a bash command which simply shows the content of a file. Just to show you guys, yep, it in fact um, wrote to a file. Um, and we can also read files by using uh, the mode R for read, and then we can uh, read the lines on that file. What is read lines? It's a list, and it being a list, we can of course iterate over it, and then we can simply go for line by line, go line by line and print every line. Note that when I print here, I have this end equals nothing. And normally if you print, Python makes you a backslash n, so a carriage return in the end. But at the end of each line, there is already a carriage return. So if you wouldn't have the end equals nothing here, um, then it would just print, uh, oops, then it would print two line breaks. We can also print only the line until the last character. Then we remove the line break at the end of each line. And then don't forget to close it. Isn't this really annoying? I'm always saying don't forget to close it. Isn't there a better way? Yes, there is. Um, context managers. So instead of opening and having to close a file explicitly, we can use the with statement. We can say with open a file as, and then here the file handle, and then we can work with the file handle, and we cannot forget to close it because as soon as we exit the indented area here, um, the context manager closes the file for us. How does it do that? because open is a context manager. So what are context managers? Context managers are simply classes that have the two dunder methods enter and exit, and as soon as we write with <laughs> um, it internally calls the dunder method enter, and as soon as we, enter the, the, we exit the indented area, it will call the dunder method exit. So if we create our own context manager here, printing context, and then write with printing context, and then print something in there, then, well, here, this will be executed before we enter the context, then we do whatever we do with the context, and then this will be, exe this will be executed after we exit the context. And how file now works <laughs> is basically like this. So if we create something, uh, if we create this, an object of class, um, 
of, of class file in this case, we need a file name and a mode here, we save them, and as soon as we enter the context, we open our file here and we return this, uh, the file handle. If we wouldn't return it, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to uh, use the ask blah, 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 because the ask mm -hmm is whatever is returned by the enter method. And then as soon as we exit the context manager, we close our open file here, and then we can use with file, save file, blah, 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 we uh, and then we can uh, do whatever we want with it, and it closes it automatically. Um, with this here, I completely reinvented the wheel. This is just the same as the file itself. So we can use, this is how file, uh, how open internally works, because open is a context manager. Okay, so you don't need this, but you do need this. Even if an exception is raised, even if you return a function, etc., etc., you can't forget to close the file here, which is why you need context managers, and it's a really <coughs> useful thing. Context managers are also used, for example, for multi-threading. If you want to have a, 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 a threading lock such that for, for stuff where only one thread is allowed to be at one time, you simply acquire the lock in the context manager and you're sure that the lock is released after you're done um, with whatever is written inside the, um, the context manager. Okay, after normal text files, um, CSVs, um, what are CSVs? Um, comma separated values. So imagine we have a CSV file here, images.csv, and in images.csv, it's basically like an, like an Excel table, right? We have the first line which describes what something is, and then we have different values which have attributes. So we have an image which has the file name emg01, it shows a cat, it's a product image, and I will cat your product image. Um, but you get the point. So it's like an Excel table. We have um, we have uh, attributes here, and we have stuff that where the attributes are written there. Okay, uh, Python offers a module for working with CSV files. It's called CSV, and let's use that. So imagine this is uh, the images underscore unformatted. It's the same one as the one above only without the spaces because in CSV files you can't make it so pretty. Uh, it in fact looks like this, it just looks worse. Okay, so um, we open our CSV file and then uh, once we have the file handle, we use csv.reader on the file handle, telling it that we uh, delimited the individual uh, items with a comma and then we can loop over that reader because that reader is iterable and then it returns us line after line where each cell is made um, element of a list. Um, we could make that a bit smarter. We could make this file list and we append to that file list every time so we now have one list. Um, but isn't it a bit annoying that we always have the first line here because the first line here is the description of what the following line <laughs> shows and the following lines are only the contents. So what if we want to remove the first line isn't it a bit annoying? How can we do that? Well, we could uh, we could have a, a, a variable first, which is true if we read the first line, and then in the first line we simply set it to false, and then continue, which will stop the loop here, and only from the second one on we append to our file list the lines. So this works. This will not show us um, the first line anymore, but. We just added four lines of code for that. that. That's a bit annoying. Can't we do better? Yes? Can you just really quickly show where this first line comes from in the line? Um, it's just in the file. If you save CSVs, it's like an Excel table. The first row of an Excel table is telling you what the columns will show. Oops. Isn't there a way around it? Uh, yes? I don't know if slicing works here. If we, say we could also slice, but that's OK. Yeah, we could slice. <laughs> I just want to show you, what is it? It's an iterable, so we can simply call next once, and then uh, we loop over it, and then we don't have the first element anymore because we iterated the iter uh, we, we got one step further on the iterator, right? But yeah, we could also slice it. This is probably more efficient, but Shh. what's efficient, more efficient? This, the, the calling, the ne calling next is probably more efficient than making a new list. Oh no, we actually can't even because it's not a list. 
It's only an iterable. I mean, we could convert it to a list um, and then slice it, but now I'm sure that this is less efficient. Um, oops. But you could also in that same line call dot next type. Hmm? Could you also in that same line just call dot next? So the same way we called. Oh, what do you mean? Yeah, then you could just do it in the line above. So ah, um, no, I cannot because it doesn't return. Um, now it's a list. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, no, 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 no. Um, that the underscore underscore next returns the first element, and the first element here is the first row. And that is a list, and now I, so that doesn't do what I want because I want it. Uh, I don't want what it returns, but I want the state of the iterable afterwards. What did you just do to get the? What you did before we talked about slices? Uh, you said you just put in something. I didn't. I wasn't able to catch up with you. Next. That yeah, one? that's exactly here. We we call next on the iterator. But what do you mean? It uh, it goes one step for so for iterables it goes one step forward. That's exactly the so I just so if you have an iterable, for example here the generator, it's one, ten, three, five. Next returns the next value of the iterable. So in this case one, and then the iterator is adva advanced one step. And then the rest of the iterator only contains the next the values after that, which is 10, 3, 5. And the reason why we don't get the first line is just because we start with the first line? We start with the second line when we call next ones, because next gets the first line, removes it from the iterator. So the iterator advances a step after the next. So we call next. So if we have the generate numbers and we call next on it, then we'll, we start the next time with the generate number right. here. And for normal iterators, they just uh, have a way to get around that. Yes. I feel like in the beginning she was uh, she was wondering why the first line is even there. It's I think scientific convention that if you gather data, you need to label the data. But then if you read the data out, you are not really interested in the first line. You just want to uh, calculate or process the data. That's why you slice it out or or just uh, don't use it and start with a line in index one. Can you go into other directions? <laughs> No, you cannot. You can't reset iterables. That is why you need to make deep copies if you want to use an iterable multiple times. Um, there's a module which uh, simply which can just import that allows it's more iter tools. It can, for example, peak the next element without actually popping it, and you can walk through iterables. You can reverse iterables and so on. I don't know how this this works internally. I would just probably it must make a list out of it because you can't know. Um, so iterables don't need to have an end, right? We could, for example, we could simply make an iterable here, just like um, we had, like just like we made our generator <laughs> here. We can simply make an um, so. Um, So if we now this would just never end. So we don't know if we what we can actually do with iterables because we don't know how the local journey. We just know that if we call next, we probably get a value or stop iteration. So um, can't assume too much. About each of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh yeah, we can also make any questions more to that. 
Yes. Uh, what does it return when it's finished, the iterator? Or the generator when it's finished, does it return none? Or um, well, the, if you define a generator yourself, you can let it return. But then if you make an iterator out of the generator, uh, then it will simply waste a stop iteration. So return none gets trans uh, return whatever gets translated into waste a stop iteration. And that just ends the loop and tells every method that works a little risk that it stops here. Yes? What exactly does the new line part in the head of open do? Is this formatting? Uh, <coughs> I don't even know why I did that. Um, what did I do that before? I'm not even sure why I used it. That's just some other code. Uh, eventually, it had a reason sometime. I'm not sure right now. Um, let's use that. Maybe it doesn't even change a thing for CSVs. Maybe it changes only for um, opening normal files. <coughs> so. I'm not sure at this point. I would have to look it up myself. Um, OK, uh, we can also directly read um, a CSV as a dictionary. And that will simply take the first line um, as the keys for the dictionary, and then use the line of whatever object we had as arguments. <coughs> so this is also a nice way. So now we. Uh, we, we stored a dictionary from a CSV file, and we can just as well save dictionaries as CSV files. So imagine here we have a dictionary of cats, um, and then we create, so we create the keys according to the keys of the first cat, and then we can write, um, use the dict writer. With, so for the dict writer, we need the argument keys, which, is, which will be the first line. And then we write the rows of the dictionary. So write header wise writes the keys. So, so the keys here are name and color because the zeroth element has name and color. And then we simply write that to a dictionary. Uh, why is this not perfect? Because we could have uh, situation where we don't have all values in the first one and then we have an error because then the keys are not all so then we only have the key for our name here and we have values for color which is no key so the dict writer doesn't know what to do uh, that's a homework to just uh, write a quick fix for that should be rather quick okay exceptions um, let's import random first because we need it uh, so now here, this year, we create a three uh, list with three items, uh, or we create uh, simply an integer, and then we want to uh, want to access the first item of that. Where because of integers, we can't access the first item. Um, it ints are not subscriptable. That would throw an error in fifty percent of cases. <coughs> okay, and what does it do? It raises um, an exception of type type exception. So we know. Um, try and catch from Java already, probably. Um, in Python, it's just the same, basically almost the same. It's not try catch, but try accept. So we try to get the first, to get the first um, <coughs> element of some of uh, our variable a here. If it works, everything works. And otherwise, we, if an exception occurs, we can, for example, also print the type of the exception. So here it worked. And if it doesn't work, then it will throw and waste an exception. We can save that exception as variable, and then we can even look at the text and the type of this exception. Okay, this here again, uh, exa an example of it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission because we simply assume that we can uh, index it, and if we can't, we simply catch or uh, we, ex we catch the exception. Okay, the syntax of try accept. Um, has a few more keywords. So uh, we have so try and then accept some random exception. And then finally, 
the block in the finally will be executed um, no matter if an exception was thrown or not. In worse languages than Python, you would have to uh, close a file, for example, in the final block. In Python, because of context managers, you luckily don't need to. But everything that will be executed, if you need, if you throw an exception or not, um, is in the finally block. Okay. If unhandled, then exceptions will go up through functions. So we have the function uh, foo here, which throws an exception here because you try to uh, get the third element of a two element list and then we catch only a file not found error this here is obviously not a file not found error and because this function here doesn't catch this exception um, it's it goes to whatever called this function which in this case is just the main script and then we can catch it there so if it's not caught it will simply go up a level to be caught hopefully um, uh, to be hopefully called um, one level up. If we wouldn't catch it here, then the compiler would um, tell us that it's not caught at all. Okay, uh, you can catch multiple exceptions in one to accept statement by simply writing the accept statement more times. You can also catch multiple exceptions with the same block by simply putting them in parentheses and uh, separating them with comma. So basically having them tuple. Um, however, in this case, only the first one will run. Because as soon as one accept block was reached, we don't look for the other ones. And because all exceptions um, are daughter classes uh, extend the class exception, um, as we see here, um, this will catch the first one already and the second one will be gone. So this here is just. Um, I think it's not even all, but these are just some exceptions. So if you catch an exception, you catch all of these here. You catch a arithmetic error, you catch those three here, and so on. If you catch general exceptions, you, if you catch base exceptions, you can even catch keyword interrupts, such that if you have a program that runs pretty long and the user wants to interrupt it with control C, but you want to gracefully shut down and have the possibility to, for example, save some variables to files when the user wants to stop you, you can do that by doing a try accept um, and uh, accept keyboard interrupt. Uh, if the user presses control C twice, however, you will not be able to catch that anymore. So you get one chance of uh, shutting down gracefully before, before the keyword, keyword interrupt will just kill your process. Yeah. yeah can you do in the accept block uh, another try and catch another uh, keyword interrupt? In theory, you could, but in fact, the compiler says. So if you could do that, you could do that infinitely, and you could just have a program that can't be stopped by the user. And to stop that, the second control C is hard. In theory, you could, yes. Yes? Or oh, did all kinds of exceptions that you can use in Python, or is it just some? These are all kinds of exceptions that are given in Python, and that will be raised eventually in Python. <laughs> so index error is if you want to have if you have a two element list and you want to get the third element <coughs> here will be the same in a dictionary and so on and so on so these are the exceptions which are thrown by python you can already create your own of course which we will do in a second okay um first of all try accept also has an else which will run if uh, no error is thrown so we try something um we catch exceptions and if no exception was Thrown, then we do whatever is in the else block. So now here, in a third of all cases, we throw an index error, a third of all cases, we throw a zero division error, and a third of all cases, we throw nothing. So this will either be, well, either the first one will be uh, printed, the second one, or the one in the else block. Well, right. um, we can even extend exception ourselves to throw our own errors. So and you just do that by simply creating any, so just an anonymous, just, just a class without any context, without any content. So we simply have some name which extends exception. We don't need any content in it. Um, but now we can, uh, well, this is obviously an exception. So it can be waste. And to waste exceptions, you only use the keyword waste. So if you have a complex program which has a certain kind of exception which you 
want to either tell the user that it's this and this kind of exception or you want to catch it yourself, uh, then you simply raise an exception and you make a class exception of your kind and you simply raise it. So imagine here we had, uh, this is a function of the method. Uh, we have here the function my method, which raises, so it takes a value and raises this <coughs> value I want an exception if the value is neither 42 nor lead. And then we can simply, for example, in our actual program, we can go through all possible values that we could accept, try it, and if this didn't throw the exception, then we can do, well, then we know at least what this function wanted. That's not a really useful example, but you get the point, I hope. And we do nothing except, mm, pass means we do nothing uh, if the exception was thrown, so we print if it worked, and we do nothing if it didn't work. Uh, we could do just the same here in an else block. It's probably <coughs> the correcter way to, the more correct way to do it. Okay, there's also a homework where you need to create your own exception. Dot, dot, dot. Let's get to the next topic, decorators. Okay, um, good. any questions to exceptions? No, okay. Decorators. So we know already of the two decorators, static method and property. And what I said always when describing them, I said dec so they change the function. Add property changes the function such that you don't need the parenthesis anymore. And add static method changes the function that you can't call it from an instance anymore. So what are decorators in general? Decorators are functions themselves that change the functionality of other functions or classes. Um, and this is usually done in a way such that uh, the original interface of the function is not changed. Okay, so imagine we have here a function subtract, which takes two values and returns x minus y. And now imagine we wanted to make that function such that it doesn't only return the result, but it also prints it first. How would we naively create that? So maybe we would make a, f a new function, decorate subtract, which takes any arguments or keyword arguments, and then in this function executes the original subtract. So we know now that, so we, we call the decorate subtract with the same parameters we would call the original subtract with, and we use simply those arguments which simply forward into the function, then we save the result here, and then we print, so we could, for example, print the name of the origin of the function we use, then we print the result, print a few lines, and then let the wrapper function also return the original. So if I now call decorated subtract, where this prints the lines here, which I showed here, prints the result of this subtract, and then prints another line, and then returns the result of, the, of its internal function. So this is how we would naively do it. So we added behavior to the subtract function. However, we didn't change the subtract function itself. We created a new function which well, contained a changed behavior of the original one. What if we wanted to change the behavior of arbitrary functions? We could make a new class, decorator, which decorated the new function decorated, which doesn't take only the original arguments, but also takes the function which is supposed to be decorated. So we could call this decorated with a function and with the arguments of a function. And that then would call, because functions are first order objects and we can simply use them, that here would call the function with the arguments and then do the same thing as above and print the results. So we can now call decorated with the parameters add, which is the function, and the, and the addition parameters five and two. So just as much as we can do that for add, we could also do that with, uh, with uh, subtract. Uh, this still does not want what we wanted it to do because it said we want to change the behavior of the subtract function. And this here is simply another function which needs this argument, the subtract function. We can go something more. And that is we change the behavior of add ourselves. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, we make a function that in its body defines another function and then returns that. Okay, so 
Let's imagine we have here the print decorator, which needs one argument, and that is the function that is to be decorated. So we call print decorator with the parameter at. And that here creates a function, namely, it calls the original function, which we decorated, prints its results, and then returns the result. And this outer thing returns this function which we just created. If we now say decorated at equals print, operator, uh, print decorator at, what we now did is we created a new method decorated at, which calls this inner function here, where func is at. Okay, so now if we call decorated at, um, it will return just what we wanted to do. It will print whatever it calculated and then return the result. Okay, so the outer one, the outer function here is only called once because when we say our decorated at is print decorator with the argument at, this here gets called, it calculates, so it generates here, it uh, uses the func here for this inner function, defines the inner function with the argument at here, and then now decorated at is this inner function where func is at. Okay, and just as much as we said, as we assigned this inner function here to decorated at, we can also um, define our at function u as this decorated at. And now every time we call at, this is exactly what we wanted. Every time we call at, it will use our um, behavior. It will, it will have the additional behavior of first printing this, then printing the result, then printing this. Okay? And what does this has to do with the add property and add static method? Well, Python offers syntactic sugar for exactly this line. And that is, we simply write add and then the name of the decorator function before a function. So this here is our print decorator function. And if we write add print decorator, and then the next line, the function which we want to decorate, then this internally, so this here is the same as if we wouldn't have it here, but then say multiply equals, what was it? What is it called? Right. Okay, so ever, if you ever see a decorator, this is only syntactic sugar for, so, for this. Yes? Uh, I may be wrong here, but um, so the, dec um, the decorator that you have written, the add decorator, mm -hmm. um, gets a function as an argument, passes it into the inner function, mm -hmm. and then it only is able to use uh, two parameters for the decorated function. So this means to me, as far as I've understood, that we have to write uh, a lot of decorators if we have different amounts of uh, uh, parameters that we pass. Isn't that no, you don't have only two arguments there. You have uh, star args and star star keyword args, which is any arbitrary number of arguments. Ah, okay, okay. Right, right, yeah. Those two are just placeholders for put in whatever you put here before, whatever okay. you did it before. Okay. Good. Um, I personally think it's really hard to wrap my head around decorators. If you see, so this here is an easy one. You can see more complex ones, which we, uh, which, which do something uh, on the arguments before the function is called or something. So their decorators can be arbitrarily complex and it's sometimes really hard to uh, wrap your head around it. But yeah, this is, haha, what did we do here? We defined multiply as the other multiply. Oh God, this is confusing. How the writing it with the add has the advantage that you can't run the code twice. If you run the, same, the code from above twice, it will decorate the decorated function such that it prints the same thing twice, obviously. And if we do that with the decorator here, it, oh yeah, it's still multiplies. Oh, geez. get the point. Don't do it with the above syntax, do it with the syntax below. Okay, um, we can even chain decorators. So, whoop, 
this is too fast. So we can, for example, here we have two decorators make, make bold and make italic. The make bold simply, well, redefines a function such that the new function returns the following, um, such that it first prints the HTML tag for, B, for bold, then the result of the function, and then the HTML tag for uh, this bold ends here. The make italic um, function does basically the same for italics. Now if we have a function hello, which prints hello world, we can use the both decorators make bold and make italic, and then the function gets decorated twice, and in the end we print a bold and italic um, hello world. Okay, um, this is, I should see that in. Okay, so this here is like intended. However, now, if we look at if we uh, take a look at our new function here, um, it says it doesn't have a doc string, even though we defined the doc string here. Why is that? Well, because the decorator defined, we defined this hello as this function here. And this actually doesn't have a, dec uh, doesn't have a doc string. And even if it would have a doc string, It would be the wrong one, right? So now it's this one here. But that's not the one we want. We want this to stay the same way as before. And we could also, for example, print the arguments of which this function requires. And then we would lose all information about what, the arg what, what uh, arguments the function wanted to have, because this here just take any arguments if you write the args and keyword args here. Uh, what you do for that is you write this you use another decorator, which is addfunctools.webs, which simply overrides the doc string of this function, which is then returned with the one of the original function. So if you use the decorator functools.webs with the argument of whatever function we have, so dec decorators, as you see, can even have arguments. I won't, won't go into too much detail here. Um, but if you do that, if you use this decorator, then the doc string we stay the one of the original function. So this is the only thing functools.webs does. Okay, another idea of how to use a decorator is, for example, a timer. Okay, so imagine we have some function, for example, subtract, and we want to time how long it took, and we want to time how long any function took. And we can simply write this decorator, clocked, which takes the time, um, executes the function, takes the time after the function was executed, and then prints the name of the function, its arguments, and the time. We get to how we print, how this uh, way it looks so fun, this format string. And then, as soon as we execute the function, once we decorated them, it tells uh, the name of the function, function name, the arguments, the result, and how long it took. So you can use the add time Dec so we can simply use the add clock decorator for any function um, and it will work for everything. Oh yeah, full throttle and throw in as well. Yes? Can you explain on the what the breath stuff? If you only, if you didn't do so, what the, what the decorator here internally does, it redefines hello as this web where the <laughs> fn is the original function. But now hello is this function. And this function may have another doc string or another um, function head, so another list of arguments and so on. And what uh, functuals.web simply does, it, it tells, so if you say it here, then it tells this method take the doc string of the original function. Take the doc string of fn. So it's only about doc string. And signature. But if you want to do good programming, that's important. Always use doc strings. Okay. Um, functional programming in Python. Um, so as much for that. Getting low on time again, of course. Um, so Python is not, does not only have influences from object-oriented programming, but also from functional programming. Functional programming basically 
doesn't want variables and stuff, you simply have a chain of functions and in the end your result is done. It's used in math a lot. Okay, and one element that comes from functional programming are lambda functions. Lambda functions are simply functions, but they are like small, throwaway, anonymous. So instead of having here def square number, which takes as argument x and returns x squared, so this here returns for a64 and is a function. Instead of this two-line syntax, we can also say square number is a lambda function, which takes this argument in x and returns x squared. So this here returns a function. We can assign that function to a variable. If we now call that, it works just the same as the original function. And its type is still function. You can also have that for multiple arguments. For example, the character date sum is now a function that takes two arguments and returns the sum of two arguments. So if we call character date sum is two and three, it will return five. Lambda functions. Small, anonymous, throwaway functions. Map, filter, and reduce. Um, like I said, Python stems from, in part, from functional programming, and map, filter, and reduce um, are used in functional programming. I will give you the example of map. Map applies a function to every element of a list. Okay, so imagine we have a list here, and we want to square every element of the list. We could make a new list squared, walk through the list, and append every item in square to the new list, map does the same. So map takes as argument a function, for example, a small throwaway lambda function, which squares, like it takes an input argument and returns the square, and takes an, iter an iterable, which is here this list, and then performs this function on all items of the list, and returns um, then a map object, which, we, which is an iterable, which means we can convert it to a list. And if we now return it, it's a list of squares. It's just functional programming syntax. It's really nice, sometimes it's really useful. Um, fun, uh, uh, the uh, map can even, even the functions can be the list, right? So imagine we have a list of functions here, multiply and add, and now for a value, we apply the function, so for each value that occurs, we apply the value, which is a function, because the list here is a list of functions. So we apply this function here on our i. So now we will get, in the first one, we will um, multiply and add one, then we multiply and add two, and then we multiply and add three, and so on. So each time we call it, so in the first one, uh, i is zero, so we call multiply of zero and zero, which is zero, then we call add of zero and zero, which is zero. So the next iteration we call multiply on one and one, which returns one, and so on and so on. Map can do actually really cool stuff, even though it's not used by most programmers, because most pro programmers come from other object-oriented languages. Um, filter. Well, a uh, filter return creates a list of elements for which a function returns true. We see that here. I'm just going to skip that. Um, yeah, reduce also there. Uh, but it's too complex to explain here. You can just look at that. It's a nice example. OK, um, list operations. Um, so for example, what we can do, we can use our map to check if all elements of a list are, in fact, ends of floats. Because we sim can simply apply this is instance functions, is instance function on all elements of a list, and that then returns a list of truth values, um, namely if the element of the list was in fact uh, true or false, uh, was in fact an int or not. I mean, and then we can use the functions all and any to check if all values in the list are true or if any value of the list are true. So printing this here, so checking for this here would also check if all values of a function are in fact ends or floats. Okay, um, then I included these functions here because you, you need them for the homework. Yes? Uh, the deadline that you have marked right now, is yeah. it also possible to just assert map and then the lambda, lambda function? Yes, check? only that this is only for one dimensional list so far. Okay. I'll get to the two dimensional case in one second. Okay, um, for the homework, you may need those functions, that's why I included them here can call sorted on list, which returns a sorted list. 
Or you can call list.sort, which in place changes this list to be now the sorted list. Okay, you may need that for the homework. We can even sort descending by, with the parameter reverse. And we can sort according to specific rules by using the, using the, uh, using the keyword argument key. Key, so if we people.sort with this key, then for every element on the list, it will um, take the element according to key and sort according to this element. So what we do here is we create a lambda function that for every element of the list, which is this row, this row, this row, for every element of the list, it returns um, this row, uh, the, the value for h. So it will now sort, it will now look, take as key for every single um, value of the list, it will take as key the h, and will sort according to that key. So with this here, we print the people by h. And if we use as key for every element, we get the name. So we read this as for every element, get the name. Um, and if we do that, we sort them by name. Other functions work similarly. So we can, for example, lists <laughs> also have the max function, which returns the maximum, also according to a key if we define it. OK. Uh, functional programming is nice, but like I said, nobody actually really uses it because list comprehensions, so the functional program elements map, filter, and reduce are nice, but list comprehensions can do the same. And Python is really well known for allowing really weird stuff in a single line, and that is in a large part due to uh, list comprehensions, or comprehensions in general. So imagine now, we want to square numbers again, we use again this syntax. Python offers that you can make this multiple line syntax. You can just make a single line out of that by using a list comprehension. So we simply say squared numbers equals a list. And in that list, you put the square of, and then every element in this list. So now squared numbers, so when we create squared numbers, we go through ele every element of original number square it, and then make a new list out of that. So this here can just as well be put into one line. So we made now out of the four line function from above, we made now a one liner. And like I said, Python is really good at doing one liners. So for example, if we have this two dimensional list, and we want to go through every single one of, the, of these values, check if the second one of each, which is the two value here, was two, and append it to <laughs> our result list if it was true. The same thing can again be done with the list comprehension. So we create a new list only trues, which puts in the new list um, where the first position, which is here one, two, three, and so on, for every element in the original list, if, and then you can have the condition here, and filter it if the second element is true. So this here will extract only those elements of the list where the first one, where the second one was true, and then add the first one of each sublist to our new list. Uh, how come, uh, how, how is it possible that you uh, ask if, or the condition is if I position? It's just syntax, it's just, this is a completely different syntax. This has nothing to do with the original if. It's just Python allows the if keyword to be in a position where you write if mm, double colon yeah. or in a position like this. But you said that if uh, uh, the uh, if it is true. Python is yeah. I, I don't see I don't see where the uh, where you. Well, Python is all about readability, and you read it just the way it's written here. Only true is a new list containing the first element of, so the first index, so the element of the first index for all elements in the original list if the second one of these is true. You, you write it as you would speak it. The question is about why you don't write equals true. Yeah. Oh, oh I can just do that because the second one is true theory. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but I, I and then one means true that like no, here, this is a list. Ah, okay. This here is the, this here is the original values list. Yes. So 
for i in original values loops through those tuples, yeah. and i1 is always the second element of those tuples, so it is a truth value. Ah, OK, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. OK, um, two minutes. I can just do I can just do that, and then we're done. I don't need to know the formal strings. OK, um, so if we don't use the square brackets around that, what do we see if we print the result? We print that it's a generator object. We know what generators are, right? So if we don't use the square brackets, we don't make a direct list out of that but we can use this as if it was a generator. So we can call next on that as long as we want. So we can do that even for infinite loops. Lists couldn't be infinite, but generators can be infinite, no problem. Okay, so as we know from before, generators are generalized iterators. And an iterator can be converted into lists, dicts, tuples, sets, you name it. So we could also make um, a tuple comprehension. So this here is a tuple comprehension which um, returns a key from a dictionary. So imagine we have a dictionary with my name, 29, Aaron, 40, Peter, 30, and we want to make a new dictionary where my name is not in, and you can make a tuple comprehension that has the syntax where curly brackets and then key colon value, and then we make a tuple comprehension that we put in every key and its value for all elements in the original dictionary if the key is not Chris. And now we move the key Chris from uh, the dictionary. We could do just the same thing with uh, map all the time, but it's just this is easier syntax for everyone who doesn't come from functional programming. And now to get to um, how do we check if a two-dimensional list um, contains all the of nodes. Well, imagine this was your list. You can go through that list to every row and every cell, and then assert that your position is in sense. But you could also assert that all, so we can go through that list, so we can have a, a two-dimensional list comprehension. So we go through every row in your data, and in that row we go for every cell in that row, and then for every element of that cell, we check if it's an instance of interflows, we make a generator out of that with our comprehension, we check if all of those are true, and this now returns if this is a one-liner for your assertion you had to uh, do for your homework. He said Python can do really dirty uh, one-liners. So set and tuple comprehension works as well. And uh, what was this again? Oh yeah, this here was um, the one from above, which is like, okay, let's say it's like seven lines here. You can easily make a one-liner of that. We can combine lambda expressions and our list comprehension here um, and our map Attribute. We can make really, really dirty one-liners in Python. It's pretty funny. Okay, um, format strings, well, that's, that's like two seconds. You can look at that at home if you need it. This is just if you want to format a string. So here, let's say, this here is a real Python string formatting syntax. You write uh, empty curly brackets somewhere and then call dot .format and then have a tuple of um, those, uh, of whatever it's supposed to put into the empty curly brackets, and then Python will just put the values in there. You can look at this at home if you need to. It takes like two minutes, really not long. And since Python 3.6, it can even make really cool those format strings by simply having an F in front of the quotation mark, and then have the name of any variable here, and then it will uh, put the variable in there. It's really nice, Python 3.6. Okay, almost on time, so thank you for your attention. We don't have any questions.